Romans 13. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, Taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So when, when I first knew that I was going to preach out of Romans 13, at first I was very excited especially knowing, knowing that many Christians, many Christian leaders in, in the United States are quoting the scripture to keep churches closed. So this stirred um, some curiosity in myself, like, um, man, why, 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 are, why are they saying so? But the closer this day was approaching, the more I realized that this is a very difficult subject and it's not easy for me. To, to speak about it, but I have to be obedient to God, so I thank him, I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, I thank you for your word, I thank you for all your words, Lord, your promises, your rebukes, Lord, I thank you, I thank you that your word is a two-edged sword, and I pray, Lord, that it will poke our hearts this morning, so you will get the glory, Lord, and we are transformed into your likeness. Lord, I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. So Romans 13 is a continuation of the main thought in Romans 12. So let's go back to Romans 12. And I'm going to read the first, the first two verses. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So the concept in chapter 13 is an outpouring of the idea of being a living sacrifice. 
in chapter 12, we saw the believer relation, responsibility towards God, towards other Christians, our responsibility towards our, our, our enemies. And today in Romans 13, we're going to look at our responsibilities towards the government. Now, the text is not that complex or difficult to understand. It identifies that the government is an institution established by God. And the principle is simple. The principle is that the government is there to punish those who do wrong and protect those who do good. So that's the principle. That's why God established the government to protect those who do good and punish those who do evil. And our responsibility is to submit to the government and pay everyone what we owe them. But what are we to do when the government fails in carrying out this principle? And instead of protecting those who do good, they promote everything that is evil. As Christians, what are we to do? Now, many of us, or at least I hope that many Christians on this island don't agree, don't like the moral choices that our government is making. For example, legalizing the same-sex marriage. After all, it's not a marriage, after all, it's a union. They want, they're preparing, they're organizing the Europe Pride Fest, which is the biggest gay pride festival in Europe. They're planning to have that here in Malta in 2023. They want to legalize the murder of an unborn human being. They want to legalize marijuana. And the myriad and, and a countless number of other immoral, evil things. Now, my goal this morning and even on Tuesday is, is not to go into a political debate. That's not my goal. But what I want to do this morning is to provoke you. But, and don't get me wrong. I don't want to provoke you because I hate you or because I don't care or simply because I have different political views. But if you, if we, if those on Zoom are sitting here this morning declaring, claiming to be Christians, then our allegiance, our faithfulness, our loyalty is to God. And no political party, whatever the color is, red, blue, yellow, green, rainbow color, whatever it is, our allegiance is to God. God, the Most High, is sovereign over the kingdom of men. And God puts in authority, puts in government, whoever he pleases. Therefore, in verse 2, Paul writes, Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Stopping, stopping there for a minute, let's turn also to John um, chapter 19, verse 10. This is when Jesus was before Pilate. And Pilate knew that he had authority. And um, in addressing Jesus, he declared, Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? And how did Jesus respond? Jesus told him, you would have no authority over me at all 
unless it had been given you from above. So the matter of fact is that all earthly authority comes from God. Simple. And we are to submit to them. Or else, if we resist them, we will bring judgment on ourselves. Now, some Christians may protest against this and say, but we believers are strangers and aliens in this earth. And we are citizens of heaven. And while this is true, believers are also living in this world. And we are representing Christ. And we are to make Jesus known with the masses and even with the governing authorities. We as Christians are to preach the gospel even to the government, even those in authority. As Christians, we are to be exemplary citizens, abiding by the civil law, unless it goes against God's law. So that's, that's, our, that's our responsibility. Obey the law, obey the government, unless it dishonors, it goes against God's law. From the smallest thing to the biggest thing imaginable. From, I don't know, spitting gum on the floor. From um, throwing trash in their predestined bags. From paying VAT when we purchase something. From not stealing um, from the electric bill. From um, not claiming or, or um, signing for any government bene benefits when you don't deserve them. We are to be model citizens. Sometimes we don't even think about these things. But we have to be of an example. Now, moving to verse 4, speaking of the one in authority now, Paul writes, he is God's servant. So the person in authority is God's servant. The government is God's servant. And here Paul introduces an idea that may, may seem hard to accept at first. Governing, author governing authorities are also agents of God. Believers and unbelievers alike. Now let's consider the Babylonian and the Persian rulers, Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus. All right. The Lord called Nebuchadnezzar his servant. So God called an evil ruler his servant. And you can refer this to in Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 9. The Lord called Nebuchadnezzar his servant because he served to bring God's judgment on the people of Judah. He called Cyrus, the Persian ruler, his shepherd and his anointed in Isaiah chapter 44. Cyrus gave permission to the Jews to return back to their land after 70 years. And he decreed also for the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the temple. So here we see two evil rulers serving God. So it is important that we submit to the governing authorities. Again, the principle is to obey all authority that God puts in our life. And this applies, this is true in the home. We know that God placed the structure in the homes. So this applies in the homes. It applies in the church, at our workplace or school, and in the nation. We are to obey our authority. Then Paul sums up this idea in verse 6 and 7. I'm going to read that again. Verse 6. 
For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. Now, that's the principle. That we are to live by honoring God as a living sacrifice. Before going into this text, I reminded you that it is important that we approach Romans 13 in light of Romans 12. If we are to live, if we want to live as a living sacrifice, we are to simply obey, submit to the government, and pay taxes. As I said already, unless the government is breaking God's law. So, are there any exceptions to Paul's teachings? So, let's consider some examples. Let's say today the government of Malta tells us um, you have to kill every two-year-old boy and under. Are we to do that? No. In Exodus chapter 1, verses 15 to 22, the king of Egypt ordered the Hebrew midwives to kill all male babies at birth. The midwives, however, feared God. They didn't fear men, they feared God. And did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. That's one example. Another example. Let's say the government um, decides to build a golden statue and we have to worship that statue or else they'll throw us into a furnace. Daniel chapter 3. Meshach, Shadrach and Abednego refused to bow down and worship the golden image. Consequently, they were thrown into a blazing furnace. But God was with them, and he rescued them. Another example, Acts chapter 4, verse 18. The Sanhedrin commanded Peter and John to cease speaking and teaching in the name of of Jesus. Now let's say the government today tells us you have to stop preaching Jesus. What are we going to do? What did Peter and John do? The apostles were brought, were brought again in front of the council and the high priest told them, we gave you strict orders not to teach in his name, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teachings. And Peter and John told them, and this is my paraphrase, they told them, is it better to obey you or is it better to obey God? Are we to please you or are we to please God? Another example now from, from modern history. Now, I know many of you are familiar with this Lutheran pastor. His name was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, he, was, he was German, and he lived in Germany during the 1930s and the 40s. And he witnessed firsthand the rise of Adolf Hitler and Nazi Germany. Immediately after Hitler was elected to be Chancellor of Germany, Bonhoeffer, as one of the most prominent pastors in Germany, addressed the nation on national radio. And he warned the German people to stop worshipping this man that they called Führer, the leader. This is Diedrich Bonhoeffer, a German pastor warning the German people. He is going against the government. Now, by far, the majority of Lutheran churches sided with Hitler. In fact, in fact, the state was giving money to the Lutheran churches. 
but a minority under the leadership of Van Hofer and Ney Moller, they didn't, they didn't want to have anything to do with this kind of church. And in fact, they went on and started another church called the Confessing Church. Now, by doing so, and by not taking the oath of loyalty towards Hitler, it was easier for the Gestapo to identify who these pastors were. And this led for 800 pastors to be arrested. Imagine that. 800 pastors didn't agree with this. 800 pastors went against this government and they arrested them. Ben Hofer was executed by hanging. And Ney Moller spent seven years in concentration camps. And then I, I asked myself, but what did the German people do? What did the nation do in face of all these atrocities? Imagine something like this happened on this, on this island. So the government tells us, no, you cannot preach, um, stop teaching in the name of Jesus, but a minority says, no, we are to obey God's word. And they throw, they throw us in jail. What would, the, what would the people of this island do? The German people showed indifference. They just didn't care. As long as they had their plate full, they didn't care. The majority of the people, including the Christians in the Third Reich, no longer believed that Christianity was worth suffering, much less dying for. They substituted the Holy Word of God, the Bible, to a manifesto, to a political manifesto written by Hitler called the Main Camp. So they chose this political manifesto over the word of God. They opted for job security, health service, and funny, funnily enough, cheap holiday schemes. Can you imagine this? And there's a lesson to learn from Nazi Germany. As Christians, what are we going to do? If we have to face these issues, what are we going to do? Are we going to choose our job security? Our, uh, are we going to choose free or cheap holidays? What are we going to do? For many, for many of the German people, listen to this. If freedom meant salvation, then slavery was preferable. They would rather be slaves to Nazi Germany than to be free in Christ. Yet, those who saved their lives lost it. And those who lost their lives saved it. Brothers and sisters, we are to obey the government, as I mentioned earlier. It's our responsibility. It's our duty. If we want to live as a living sacrifice, we are to obey the government. Unless it goes against God's word. We are Christian first. We are Christian even before being Maltese or whatever nationality. We are Christians first. And our allegiance, our loyalty, our faithfulness is to God and God alone. We are to obey the government but not conform to its ways. So I hope, 
I hope this message encourages you. Even, even during this, th these times of a pandemic or whatever, some call it a pandemic, whatever it is, these are hard times. And unless the government tells us to break God's law, we are to abide by the civil laws. But to give you the last, last, last example, just came in my mind right now. Um, in, in the state of California, during this, this pandemic, many, I'm, I'm going to use maybe a, a hard word, stupid laws were putting in, uh, in, in, in actions. All right? So they don't consider church as essential, but a coffee shop is essential. And coffee shop is not where you drink coffee, but where you smoke weed. All right? And liquor shops, they're considered, as, considered essentials, but not the church. But a man, a pastor, said, no, we are going to meet, we're going to have fellowship, we're going to obey the measures. Yes, if we need to wear masks, we wear masks, we keep our distances. Yes, but we're going to have fellowship. We're going to preach the word of God. We're going to evangelize. We're going to be, be the light of this world. So again, brothers and sisters, I urge you, whatever your political view is, red, blue, whatever it is, remember, we are Christians first. And we are his ambassadors. If we say that we are his ambassadors, but we prefer or we support all these political agendas, then make a favor to yourselves first and to God, and don't say that you're Christians at all. We are ambassadors of God. We are disciples of Jesus Christ. So let him be the Lord of our lives and not the government and not and, and any, any authority. Yes, we submit to the government. And last thing, I want to read scripture from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 3. This is another responsibility that Paul gives us. Even if you agree or not with the government, he tells us to do one thing. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 and 3. First of all, then, I urge you that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, not some people, all the ones that I agree with, but for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior. So, brothers and sisters, let's take action on the scripture. Let's stand up, and let's pray for our government. Let's pray for the leaders in Europe, for the governing leaders in, um, in the USA, for the governing leaders even in, in communist China. Let's pray for these people, as Paul told us to. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for your holy word. Yes, Lord, as you tell us, we pray for the government of this island. Yes, Lord, I pray first of all for their salvation. Lord, I pray that you will use your church. You will use each and every one of us. To be an example to these leaders. To preach the gospel to these leaders, Lord. Yes, Lord, we want to live a quiet, peaceful, holy life. We must pray constantly for our leaders, for this nation. Lord, I pray that you will give them wisdom during these times. Lord, I pray for the European Union, and I pray for Biden, I pray for the Chinese government. Lord, you know, some way or another, Lord, I, ple I pray, save them, Lord. 
save them, Lord. And Lord, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you give us the boldness, you give us the courage to say no to what is wrong and say yes to what is good. It doesn't matter who says it, if the red party, blue party, green party, I don't care who says it, Lord. If it's good, it's good, but if it's bad, if it's evil, it's evil. Give us the courage, the ability, the power to say no. And Lord, I pray that when we face these situations like Nazi Germany did, I pray, Lord, that we will stay strong. Lord, I pray that the church will unify itself. When the government tells us, unless you support the LGBTQ alphabet people, Lord, I pray that we stay strong and we keep preaching your word. Because your word is true and your promises are yes and amen. We bless you and we glorify your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.